Memorial in Protest of Cherokee Nation, written by John Ross, June 21st, 1836. To the Honorable, the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of North America in Congress assembled. The undersigned representatives of the Cherokee Nation, east of the River Mississippi, impelled by duty, would respectfully submit for the consideration of your honorable body the following statement of facts. It will be seen from the numerous subsisting treaties between the Cherokee Nation and the United States that from the earliest existence of this government, the United States, in Congress assembled, received the Cherokees and their nation into favor and protection, and that the chiefs and warriors, for themselves and all parts of the Cherokee Nation, acknowledged themselves and said Cherokee Nation to be under the protection of the United States of America and of no other sovereign whatsoever. They also stipulated that said Cherokee Nation will not hold any treaty with any foreign power, individual state, or with individuals of any state. That for and in consideration of valuable concessions made by the Cherokee Nation, the United States solemnly guaranteed to said nation all their lands not ceded, and pledge the faith of the government that, quote, all white people who have intruded or may hereafter intrude on the lands reserved for the Cherokees shall be removed by the United States and proceeded against according to the provisions of the act, passed 30th March 1802, entitled, quote, an act to regulate trade and intercourse with the Indian tribes and to preserve peace on the frontier, end quote. It would be useless to recapitulate on the numerous provisions for the security and protection of the rights of the Cherokees to be found in the various treaties between their nation and the United States. The Cherokees were happy and prosperous under the scrupulous observance of treaty stipulations by the government of the United States and from the fostering hand extended over them. They made rapid advances in civilizations, morals, and the arts and sciences. Little did they anticipate that when taught to think and feel as American citizen, and to have with him a common interest, they were to be despoiled by their guardian, to become strangers and wanderers in the land of their fathers, forced to return to the savage life, and to seek a new home in the wilds of the far west, and that without their consent. An instrument purporting to be a treaty with the Cherokee people has recently been made public by the President of the United States that will have such an operation if carried into effect. This instrument, the delegation ever before the civilized world, and in the presence of Almighty God is fraudulent, false upon its face, made by unauthorized individuals without sanction, and against the wishes of the great body of the Cherokee people. Upwards of 15,000 of those people have protested against it, solemnly declaring they will never acquiesce. The delegation would respectfully call the attention of your honorable body to their memorial and protest with the accompanying documents submitted to the Senate of the United States on the subjects of the alleged treaty, which are herewithin transmitted. If it be said that the Cherokees have lost their national character and political existence as a nation or tribe by state legislation, then the President and Senate can make no treaty with them. But if they have not, then no treaty can be made for them, binding without and against their will. Such is the fact in reference to the instrument entered into the new Dakota in December last. If treaties are to be thus made and in force, deceptive to the Indians and to the world, purporting to be a contract when, in truth, wanting the assent of one of the pretended parties, what security would there be for any nation or tribe to retain confidence in the United States? If interest or policy require that the Cherokees be removed, without their consent, from their lands, surely the President and Senate have no constitutional power to accomplish that object. They cannot do it under the power to make treaties, which are contracts, not rules prescribed by a superior, and therefore binding only by the assent of the parties. In the present instance, the assent of the Cherokee Nation has not been given, but expressly denied. The President and Senate cannot do it under the power to regulate the commerce with the Indian tribes or intercourse with them, because that belongs to Congress 
and so declared by the President in his message to the Senate of February 2, 1831, relative to the execution of the Act to regulate trade and intercourse with the Indian tribes, and so on, past 30th of March, 1802. They could not do it under the subsisting treaty stipulation with the Cherokee Nation, nor does the particular situation of the Cherokees, in reference to the states, their necessities and distresses, confer any power upon the President and Senate to alienate their legal rights or prescribe the manner and time of their removal. Without a decision of what ought to be done under existing circumstances, the question recurs, is the instrument under consideration a contract between the United States and the Cherokee Nation? It so purports upon its face, and that falsely. They have denied it under their own signatures, as the documents herein before referred to will show, and protested against the acts of the unauthorized few who have arrogated to themselves the right to speak for the nation. The Cherokees have said they will not be bound thereby, the documents submitted to the Senate show that when the vote was taken upon considering the propositions of the commissioner, there were but seventy-nine for so doing. Then it comes to this. Could this small number of persons attending the New Dakota meeting, acting in their individual capacity, dispose of the rights and interests of the Cherokee Nation, or by any instrument they might sign, confer such power upon the President and Senate? If the United States are to act as the guardian of the Cherokees, and to treat them as incapable of managing their own affairs, and blind to their true interests, yet this would not furnish power or authority to the President and Senate, as the treaty-making power to prescribe the rule for managing their affairs. It may afford a pretense for legislation of Congress, but none for the ratification of an instrument as a treaty made by a small faction against the protest of the Cherokee people.